Women's Liberation, a Marxist Tradition, by Sharon Smith. Section. Social Class and Women's Oppression. In 1909, Russian revolutionary Alexander Kolontai wrote what proved to be a defining contribution to the Marxist analysis of women's oppression. Quote, the social basis of the, of the woman question, in which she argued, beginning a long quote, The women's world is divided, just as is the world of men, into two camps. The interests and aspirations of one group bring it close to the bourgeois class, while the other group has close connections to the proletariat, and its claims for liberation encompass a full solution to the woman question. Thus, although both camps follow the general slogan of the, quote, liberation of women, their aims and interests are different. Each of the groups unconsciously takes its starting point from the interests and aspirations of its own class, which gives a specific class coloring to the targets and tasks it sets for itself. However apparently radical the demands of the feminists, one must not lose sight of the fact that the feminists cannot, on account of their class position, fight for that fundamental transformation of society, without which the liberation of women cannot be complete. But the other side of Kollontai's approach involved an effort to convince working class men of the need to support the demands of women workers. The Bolsheviks intervened in strikes and struggles involving a majority of male workers, arguing that working men's class interests lay in fighting for demands such as maternity protection and equal pay for women. In preparation for the first All-Russian Congress of Trade Unions in 1917, Kolontai called upon working class men to support equal pay for women workers, arguing, Quote, the class-conscious worker must understand that the value of male labor is dependent on the value of female labor, and that by threatening to replace male workers with cheaper female labor, the capitalist can put pressure on men's wages, lowering them to the level of women's wages. Therefore, only a lack of understanding could lead one to see the question of equal pay for equal work as purely a, quote, woman's issue. At the same time, it would be inaccurate to assume that classical Marxists disregarded the plight of middle-class or even bourgeois women. On the contrary, Clara Zetkin expressed clear empathy with all women subjugated within the nuclear family. As she argues in 1896, family law dictates to upper-class wives that their husbands are their superiors. Quote, she is still dependent upon her husband. The guardianship of the weaker sex has survived in the family law, which still states, and he shall be your master. She also argues, quote, The bourgeois woman not only demands her own bread, but she also requests spiritual nourishment and wants to develop her individuality. It is exactly among these strata that we find these tragic, yet psychologically interesting, Nora figures. Women who are tired of living like dolls in dollhouses, and who want to share in the development of modern culture. The economic as well as the intellectual and moral endeavors of bourgeois women's rights advocates are completely justified. End of quote. In the same contribution, Zetkin also argues that middle-class women quote, are not equal to men in the form of possessors of private property as they are in the upper circles. The women of these circles have yet to achieve their economic equality with men, and they can only do so by making two demands, the demand for equal professional training and the demand for equal job opportunities for both sexes. This battle of competition pushes the women of these social strata towards demanding their political rights, so that they may, by fighting politically, 
tear down all barriers which have been created against their economic activity. End quote. There is an important distinction, noted by Zetkin above, between ruling class and middle class women. Middle class women, like all members of the middle class, experience wide-ranging financial, employment, and life circumstances. The upper middle class approaches the lifestyle of the ruling class, while the lower middle class faces conditions barely discernible from workers. Thus, middle class women can be pulled in different political directions, some gravitating towards the bourgeoisie and others identifying with the interests of workers. Indeed, Zetkin, writing in 1896 with tremendous foresight, remarked on the increasing tendency towards the proletarianization of mental labor, affecting academics and other professions, a factor that is far more relevant today than in Zetkin's time. Beginning of quote. Within the bourgeois intelligentsia, Another circumstance leads to the worsening of the living conditions. Capitalism needs the intelligent and scientifically trained workforce. It therefore favored an overproduction of mental work proletarians and contributed to the phenomenon that the formerly respected and profitable societal positions of members of the professional class are more and more eroding. End of section.